Hi everyone. Thanks for coming to this talk on supersingular curves with small non-integer endomorphisms. My name is Jonathan Love, and I will be presenting on some joint work with Dan Bonet. Before we start, I want to give a big picture overview of where we're going. We will be exploring the collection of supersingular elliptic curves, which can be a very large, complicated, and mysterious set. So our main goal is to describe a nice, easily accessible subclass of the set of all supersingular curves and analyze its structure. One notable feature of the curves in this set is that we can find isogenies between them that can't reasonably be found by searching on L isogeny graphs alone. And this may have applications in isogeny-based cryptography. We'll start with some definitions and examples for background, move on to discussing isogeny graphs, briefly touching on their applications to cryptography, and then finally, we will describe this new set of curves. For this talk, P will always denote some large prime, and E and E prime will refer to elliptic curves that are defined over a finite field F of characteristic P. In order to move between different elliptic curves, we use isogenies. An isogeny is a map of algebraic varieties that sends the identity of E to the identity of E prime. This essentially just means that we can express the map using rational functions in the coordinates. For our purposes, the coefficients can be anything in the algebraic closure of f. Despite being defined geometrically, isogenies actually also preserve the group structure of the elliptic curves. A key quantity associated to any isogeny is its degree. If the isogeny is separable, the degree just corresponds to the number of points in E that map to a single point in E prime. As an example of what an isogeny looks like, you can consider this map. If x and y satisfy the equation of E, then the outputs satisfy the equation of E prime. This is an example of an isogeny of degree two. Now, if you have an isogeny from a curve to itself, we call it an endomorphism. Now, technically we excluded constant maps from the definition of isogenies, but we will also include the zero map as an endomorphism. So for example, given any elliptic curve and any integer n, multiplication by n gives an endomorphism of the curve, and this has degree n squared. But we can also have non-integer endomorphisms. For instance, if e is defined by y squared equals x cubed plus x, then if we negate x and multiply y by i, this preserves the equation of the curve. This gives us an example of a non-integer endomorphism of degree 1. Now, if we consider the set of all endomorphisms, we can add them pointwise, and we can compose them with each other. And this gives the set the structure of a ring. The endomorphism ring of an elliptic curve over a finite field can fall into one of two categories. On the one hand, the endomorphism ring may be a two-dimensional lattice, specifically an order in an imaginary quadratic field. In this case, we call the elliptic curve ordinary. On the other hand, the endomorphism ring could be a four-dimensional lattice, specifically an order in a quaternion algebra. In this case, the endomorphism ring is not commutative, and we call E supersingular. The lattice structure of the endomorphism ring carries some important information, because the degree is a quadratic form on endomorphisms that agrees with the usual norm on the quadratic field for the quaternion algebra in question. This allows us to talk meaningfully about long and short endomorphisms. Now, as you'll soon see, this dichotomy between ordinary and supersingular curves will determine a lot about the nature of isogenies between the curves. Let's talk about isogeny graphs. Given a prime L, usually taken to be much smaller than P, we can define a graph structure on the set of elliptic curves over a given finite field by declaring two curves to have an edge between them if there is an isogeny of degree L from one to the other. Let's look at a specific example. We're gonna set P to equal 401 and consider the set of all curves defined over FP squared, connecting them by isogenies of degree three. The graph breaks up into a bunch of components called isogeny classes. If we take the component containing an ordinary curve in this case, I took the elliptic curve with j invariant 44. We find a graph that looks like this. 
But if we start with a super singular curve, in this case, I took the elliptic curve with j invariant zero, we get a graph that instead looks like this. It's just a little bit less organized, to say the least. Now, this observation from this example holds more generally. Components of ordinary curves always take the structure of volcanoes, where you have a cycle in the middle and trees coming outward from the vertices on the cycle. There's a great survey by Andrew Sutherland from the 10th ANTS conference that discusses these volcano graphs. But components of super singular curves have very strong randomizing properties. Specifically, they are Ramanujan graphs, which implies that any random walk will converge extremely rapidly to the uniform distribution on the graph. Because of this strong mixing property, the super singular components of L isogeny graphs have been proposed as a source of cryptographic primitives. While it is straightforward to compute isogenies from a given curve, it is believed to be very hard to find an isogeny between two randomly selected elliptic curves. A number of cryptographic primitives have been built around this hard problem. And while I sadly won't have time to give them all their proper due, I wanted to list a few of them. There is a hash function due to Charles, Loder, and Gorin, a Diffie-Hellman key exchange due to DeFeo, Zhao, and Plu, a commutative supersingular isogeny Diffie-Hellman due to Kastrick, Long, Martindale, Panny, and Renes, and many, many others. Now, most of these algorithms require at least having a supersingular curve to start with. But how do we find such a thing? Only about 1 over 12p of all elliptic curves over fp squared are supersingular, which means that if you choose an elliptic curve at random, you will not find supersingular ones unless you are extremely lucky. An algorithm due to Reiner Broecker provides one method. It starts by finding an elliptic curve with complex multiplication over some number field, and then reduces modulo a prime of that field to get a curve defined over a finite field of characteristic p. There's then a simple congruence condition relating the discriminant of the number field to p that will determine whether this reduction is supersingular. If you then want a random curve and not just this one that the algorithm gives you, you can just take a random walk on an arbitrary LS isogeny graph of your choice. In some situations, however, this approach may not be sufficient. There are certain applications that call for the existence of a hard curve. That is, a curve for which no one, not even the party who generated the curve, knows how to compute the endomorphism ring. The reason this may be desirable is that there are certain cryptographic applications that can be easily backdoored if the endomorphism ring is fully known. See the reference here, for example, of a verifiable delay function that has this property. So if you don't trust the generator of the curve, you might prefer that the curve be generated using a technique that can't be taken advantage of in this way. Unfortunately, no one knows how to construct such a hard curve. Part of the problem with this is that whenever you take a walk on an L isogeny graph from a starting point where you know the endomorphism ring, you can use the path to compute the endomorphism ring of all of the points along the way. So any candidate hard curve can't be generated using walks on an isogeny graph. Alternate methods are needed. This need for alternate methods was our motivation for exploring the set of curves that will be the focus for the rest of the talk. Unfortunately, these curves are not hard in the above sense, so the problem of generating a hard curve is still open. However, we will see that there is structure in this set that can't be seen using L isogeny graphs alone. For this section, we're going to take a gigantic prime p and a parameter n that, roughly speaking, uh, it should be small enough that it should be possible to perform computations that are polynomial in M. In this setup, we say that an elliptic curve is M small if there exists a non-integer endomorphism of E that has degree at most M. These curves can be ordinary or supersingular, but among the set of supersingular curves, the M small ones are fairly rare. Given a randomly chosen supersingular curve, the smallest non-integer endomorphism will typically have degree on the order of p to the 2 thirds. This means that the endomorphism lattice will have one direction of very tightly packed elements, namely the integers. Whereas if you go in any other direction, the endomorphisms are extremely sparse. In contrast, 
the M small supersingular curves have two dimensions worth of relatively short endomorphisms. There's a lot that we can say about the set of M small curves. For one, we know roughly how many there are. The number of M small curves grows at most on the order of M to the three over two. In fact, we can actually compute the entire set of M small curves in time polynomial in M using a generalization of Broca's algorithm. Now, earlier I said that a randomly selected elliptic curve is very unlikely to be super singular, but this doesn't hold for M small curves. In fact, experiments and heuristics both imply that roughly half of all M small curves are super singular. So this makes them a very rich source of super singular curves. It's true that M small curves are unfortunately not hard curves in the above sense, but on the flip side, this means that they form a class of curves for which we understand their endomorphism rings and isogenies quite well. The last property I want to discuss, which is the main result of our paper, is one describing the clustering of M small curves. Precisely, for each negative fundamental discriminant D that's greater than four, negative 4M four and not a square modulo P, we can define a subset T sub D of M small curves. These subsets T sub D are arranged in a really nice way, in the sense that any two of them are very, very far apart. The shortest isogeny between two distinct subsets T sub D um, has degree at least square root of P over 2M which recall, we chose P to be massive, so this is a huge degree isogeny. On the other hand, if two curves are in the same set T sub D, then one can form a chain of short isogenies linking the two curves that stays entirely within T sub D. One minor technical point is that this clustering only holds if a curve over FP squared and its conjugate are identified. So one may need to replace the final curve in this chain with its conjugate in order for the result to hold. So how do we visualize this theorem? Let's look at an example where we're looking at the set of 12 small supersingular curves in characteristic 20,011. This graph contains all supersingular curves and it connected two with an edge if there is any isogeny of degree two or three between them, as two and three are the primes less than four over pi square root of 12. As you can see, there's a clump for each fundamental discriminant and it is not easy to find a path joining separate clumps. That said, we do know how to compute isogenies between any two M small curves, even though these isogenies may have very, very large degree. These are isogenies that could not be reasonably found by an L isogeny graph search. There's another feature of this set, which is invisible at the level of L isogeny graphs. You may notice that we had to include both degree two and three isogenies to form this graph. This is actually essential for the clustering phenomenon to occur. In fact, we have the following result. If L is a sufficiently small prime, then you can always find two supersingular curves E and E prime in the same set T sub D, for which the only short paths between them have degree divisible by L. That is, if you take any isogeny with degree relatively prime to L, it will have degree at least P times L over 4M, which again, recall, is absolutely massive. This demonstrates that there can be curves that are very close in the L isogeny graphs that are not close in any other prime degree isogeny graph. To wrap up, we've seen that the set of M small curves is a set of super singular curves that is comparatively straightforward to analyze and to work with. We also have techniques for studying isogenies between them, including very large degree isogenies that could not be reasonably found by taking walks on L isogeny graphs. Whether these techniques may be modified to apply to other sets of curves as well has yet to be seen and may be a topic for further exploration. This brings us to the end of the talk, but if you have any questions or want to discuss this further, feel free to email Dan and me. Thank you very much for listening.